Thank you, Thomas. We are all watchmen, and we sh our voices should be heard that Jesus is coming soon. Amen. amen and amen. Thank you, RC and April, for helping and making us and helping us sound beautiful. Our scripture reading this morning, if we turn to it, it's found in the book Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7. Now I can give you time to find it. It is in the Old Testament, right after Micah. Right before Habakkuk. <clears throat> Nahum chapter 1, verse 7, the Bible says, The Lord is good. Amen. Amen. A stronghold in the day of trouble. A stronghold in the day of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. Does God know you to trust in him? Many people claim to trust and have faith in Jesus, in God. But here it says, a stronghold, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the time of trouble. And he knows those who trust in him. Are you one of those that trust in him? Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we open your word, we want you to know us that we fully trust in you. You are coming sooner than, we, than what we think. And every day we need to trust more in you. As we open your word, please open our minds and Fill us with your Holy Spirit through your Holy Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We will be spending time in the book of Mark, chapter 5. So you can go there in advance, Mark, chapter 5. But before we do, how is it when you face life's problems? When facing life's problems, sometimes they can be overwhelming. They can be too much. And we may find ourselves so weak and not knowing just what to do and wanting sometimes just to give up. To give up if it's an illness, to give up with the doctors. If it's finances, just give it up, forget it. And sometimes along giving up, people tend to give up God as well. Because God did not answer, in quotations, their prayers. It can be overwhelming. And I don't know how it is with you, but I am a weak person. And whenever the burdens of life come to the Charles home, we are so weak that we have to fully rely on God. Fully rely on God. Because his power is limitless. Mine does have a limit. I get tired. I get fed up. But God's power is limitless. So if God's power is limitless, there is no limit, why then do we worry? When we worry, who is trying to solve the problems? We are. The more I worry, the more I'm, I'm thinking, well, I, if I, I try plan A, then I, I gotta have a plan B. I have a, I have a brother-in-law who, 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 who always is thinking, you always have to have a plan A and a plan B and even a plan C. Because if A doesn't work, you need a backup. But that's what happens when we, when we worry. 
When we worry, we, we want to solve the problems ourselves. And my worry, the more I worry about something, is a sign that I am relying on Harley. You follow what I'm saying? Our worry is a signal, is a sign that I'm approaching or that we are approaching the problems based on our strength, not on God's strength. We're going to look at a story in Mark chapter 5. And we're facing a problem in life. Do not measure the problem by your strength, which is limited. But measure it, the problem, by the strength in Christ, which is unlimited. Do not measure it by your strength, because our strength is limited. We can only go so far. But measure it by the power of God, who is unlimited. <clears throat> and one of the dangers that sometimes we can come into is in relying so much in ourselves that we feel we have it all. And that's a danger especially, especially I feel, as Seventh-day Adventists. One of the dangers of being a Seventh-day Adventist is being a Seventh-day Adventist. Because we are so mentally equipped with Bible stuff. We know so much about the Bible. But yet we forget, we forget that wisdom comes from God. We forget that it all comes from Him. We, we explain doctrine very well and we do a good job. We, we are good theologians as Seventh-day Adventists. And we explain doctrine very well. <clears throat> But we forget that besides doctrine and knowing about the Bible and about God, we need to know God and have a relationship with Him. Amen. And have a relationship with Him. We become so confident in our membership in the church and think that that is going to solve our problems and forget that the church is actually rests on the rock, which is Jesus Christ. You need Jesus, not just having your name on the membership. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. Because when you're facing life's problems, when you're going through a crisis, knowing that the Sabbath is Saturday isn't going to solve your crisis. When you're going through a financial situation where you have meet the end of the road, whatever finances, knowing that the dead are asleep is not going to pay the bills. We need to know Jesus. Now before I get misunderstood, we do need information and doctrine. Amen. The Bible says in, in, in 2 Timothy 3.16 that the Bible, the Word of God, is profitable for doctrine. It's good. A church without doctrine isn't a church. It's just a get-together of hanging out. <laughs> we do need doctrines, but we need a relationship with Christ. Amen. Let's not forget that we need both. Information about God, but God as our friend. God as our friend. And when, and when you combine both the doctrine and the relationship, you have a beautiful walk with God. A beautiful walk with God. So Mark chapter 5 is what we're going to be looking at. In Mark chapter 5, we have three different stories. The first story is a man who is filled with demons. The second, another story is a woman who is filled with disease. And there is another story of a man who is filled with himself. A man who has a dying daughter. All three of them are filled with something. The man is full of demons and has let the demons take over his mind. The woman who is full of diseases has her body is taken over by this disease 
and the ruler that we're going to look at today is full of himself and the problems of life have taken away his hope. So if you, if you join me there in Mark chapter 5 verse 21, 20, 21 through 24. Now when Jesus had crossed over again by boat to the other side, a great multitude gathered to him and he was by the sea. And behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue named Jairus by name. And when he saw him, he fell at his feet and begged him earnestly saying, my little daughter lies at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. So Jesus went with him, and a great multitude followed him, and what? Thronged him, were with him. It's interesting that here, this ruler, what's his name? Jairus. Jairus is the only time his name is mentioned. In the whole story, he is known as the ruler. And the ru when Jesus went to the ruler's house. And the ruler asked this. And they came to the ruler. For some reason, the Holy Spirit inspired Mark to write this man known as a ruler. He threw in his first name just so we know what he is called. But he is a ruler. Why would that be significant? What do rulers like to do? Rule? Okay, let's think a little bit harder. What do rulers like to do? They like to command. They like to give orders. And being a ruler was his problem. You see there in verse 22 and 23, and behold, one of the rulers of the synagogue, he came. Jairus was his name, and when he saw him, he fell down at his feet and begged him earnestly, saying, My daughter lies at the point of death. And then he says, Come and lay your hands on her, that she may be healed, and she will live. He comes to Jesus, falls at his, on, on his knees at Jesus' feet, and begs Jesus. But not just begs Jesus to come over, but it tells Jesus, come to my house and then lay your hands on her and heal her. He doesn't just ask for a request, can you please heal her? He is telling Jesus, you come to my house and when you get there, you're going to lay your hands, I'm going to show you how you're going to do this. Lay your hands on her and heal her. He was telling Jesus how to do it and when to do it. He's a ruler. That's what, that's what rulers do. It's interesting here in, the, in Desire of Ages, on this, the, the chapter on this story, chapter 36, but it's page 342. It says, Jesus set out at once with the ruler for his home. Though the disciples had seen so many of his works of mercy, they were surprised at his compliance with the, with the entreaty of the rabbi. The, the disciples were surprised that Jesus went. And then it says here, they were surprised at his compliance with the entry of the haughty rabbi. What's haughty? Yet, yet they accompanied their master, and the people followed eagerly and, and, ex, and followed the disciples. So here the ruler is, is, is kind of telling Jesus what to do and how to do it. He is humble, but yet kind of bossy. He has a haughty spirit. And that sometimes can be our problem when we come to Jesus. We ask for something, and we want to tell him how to do it and when to do it. 
I don't want to see a show of hands, but you know, somebody looking for a spouse and they pray to the Lord, Lord, I'm looking for a spouse. I want to be married and I'm looking for the right person. That is very important that you don't fall in love, but you step into it carefully. Amen? Amen, Amen. yes. Which it should be an intelligent de decision. And we pray to God, Lord, please help me find the right person, the right boy, the right girl. But I want them tall, slim, and handsome. <laughs> and maybe God may give you somebody short, fat, but nice. <laughs> we don't know. But here, we sometimes are like this ruler. Lord, I want you to come. And when you come, you're going to lay your hands. And you'll heal her. And we got to do it now because she is very, very sick. So let's get moving quickly. And we're going to see that in the, in the story as well. We all sometimes act like Jairus in asking God to do it our way. But notice what Jesus teaches him a lesson and us a lesson as well. Because on their way, praise the Lord, somebody else needs Jesus besides him. Notice verse 25. Now a certain woman had had a flow of blood for 12 years and had suffered many things from many physicians. She had spent all that she had and was not better, but rather grew worse. But when she heard about Jesus, she came behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if only I may touch his clothes, I shall be made well. Jesus is nice and goes with this ruler. But what's interesting is that Jesus is not controlled by the ruler. Do you think the ruler was in a hurry to get Jesus at his house? Just the next, the next paragraph there in this chapter talking about this ruler and Jesus on their journey. The ruler's house, this is the same page 342, the ruler's house was not far distant. But Jesus and his companions advanced slowly, for the crowd pressed him on every side. The anxious father was impatient. I would be too. Maybe you and I are impatient. But Jesus, pitying the people, notice what it says, stopped now and then to relieve some suffering ones or to comfort a troubled heart. Jesus wasn't in a hurry. The ruler was. We gotta go. And we gotta go now. And Jesus says, let's go. And as they're going, I can, I can, picture, I can picture Jesus stopping because somebody is reaching out to him. And Jesus stops or maybe slows down and has a word of prayer with them comforts them. And what's the ruler thinking? Don't worry about them. I came and prayed for you first. I came and asked your help first. These people can wait. But Jesus is not controlled by the ruler, friends. And we cannot control Jesus. We cannot control Jesus. Verses 25 Well, we read that part in verse 29, 29 through 31, it says, Immediately the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed. And Jesus, immediately knowing in himself that power had gone out of him, that's important, we're going to come back to that, turned around in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? But his disciples said to him, You see the multitude thronging you, and you say, Who touched me? There was a difference between this woman's touch and the ruler's touch. They both wanted Jesus to do a miracle. But there was a difference between both the ruler's touch and this woman's touch. 
The woman knows nothing about the ruler and his daughter. All she knows is that I need to touch Jesus. I need his power. And the lesson that Jesus teaches this ruler is that you're not the only one in the block who needs healing. You're not the only one who needs me. You're not the only one that needs a miracle. And sometimes in our weakness, friends, we make our problems bigger than other people's problems. And here Jesus is telling this ruler, other people have problems too. <clears throat> so you can imagine Jairus there walking with Jesus and Jesus stops and he's thinking, oh, okay, he's going to probably pray for somebody else again. And he stops and says, you know, who touched my clothes? Who touched me? And the disciples, we hear what, what, what they said. But it's interesting because what does a woman say? They're in verse 32. And he looked around to see who had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell down before him and told him, what does the Bible say? Partly truth, all the truth, the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your afflictions. <clears throat> Keeping in mind that this ruler is in a hurry to get home. And when Jesus stops to see who touched him, and she's trembling and says, I did. And the Bible says that she told him the whole truth. The whole truth. Here was the turning point for the ruler. Now, I don't, I don't want to be unkind to the ladies. But us gentlemen know, and some ladies know, that when a woman tells you all the truth, <laughs> the whole truth, it is not a five-minute conversation. <laughs> Women love to go into details, amen? amen? God made us different. It's not a sin. <laughs> Don't, it's not, there's nothing wrong. But God made us different. And here she begins to explain the whole truth. And how long was she sick? Twelve years. And Jairus is what? Well, he, oh, he, he's not looking at his wrist, but he is... He, he, he probably got that look that some of us men get right when our wives begin to explain that Okay. You wanna you want some some counsel, man? You know you know the best thing you can do is be quiet and listen. <laughs> Amen. 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 And and the ruler there is waiting for her to be quiet. Yes, you were healed. Okay, thank you. We gotta go. But Jesus doesn't hurry her up. Jesus listens to every single one. Jesus is not controlled by the ruler. And we cannot control Jesus either when we come to him. Amen. Sometimes Jesus puts us in a spot where he is the only answer. And that's exactly what happened here, friends. Notice verse 35. After, after the woman told all the truth. And then in verse 34, I'm sorry, it says, And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be, and be healed of your affliction. And Jairus was probably like, Amen, let's go. And you know, friends, I'm glad you're laughing. But Jairus wouldn't be laughing. No. 
when we have come to God in a request, in a crisis, in a concern, it's not of a laughing matter when God isn't hurrying up. So I kind of feel for this ruler. But yet verse 35 says, While he was still speaking, some came to the ruler of the synagogue's house, who said, Your daughter is what? Is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? Now we read in, the, in Desire of Ages that the journey was short. So Jesus, besides this woman, must have also stopped with other people. But somehow, this young girl dies. And then the Bible says, why trouble the teacher any further? Don't bother him anymore. Sometimes Jesus puts us in a spot where, all the, where the only answer that is left is for, for him to come in. For him to come in. You tried every plan, every idea, but nothing works. And here the daughter dies, so in his mind there is no more need for Jesus. Why trouble him anymore? She already died. In their mind and in his mind, your services are no longer needed. And it appears that death has made Jesus unnecessary. And when you reach a situation that nothing else can be done, we may act like this ruler. Brothers and sisters, nothing intimidates Jesus. Not even death. Not even death intimidates God. Even the grave. He is an expert in doing what cannot be done. He is an expert in doing what cannot be done. God is not threatened by any human situation, friends. Amen. God is not threatened by any human situation. Here the ruler wants to get him to his house and Jesus, Jesus, you know, in his gentleness, not fussing, not saying, don't worry. She dies, I'll raise her up. No. He stays calm. He doesn't fuss, but without condemnation, he is teaching this ruler that you are not in charge. I am. He is teaching the ruler who is the real ruler. Praise the Lord. Amen. Praise the Lord. God is not threatened by any human situation. We just need to be humble enough to get out of his way. There in verse 36. As soon as Jesus heard the word that was spoken, he said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be afraid, only believe. And he permitted no one to follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. Then he came to the house of the, of the ruler of the synagogue and saw the multitude and those who were and those who wept and wailed loudly. When they came to him, he said to them, Why make this commotion and, and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. And what did Jesus do? Get him out. Get him out. And then he goes into the room with Peter, James, and John, and, and the mother and father. Verse 41 says, Then he took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha kumi, which is translated, Little girl, I say to you, arise. Arise and get up. Do not, be not afraid, but only believe. That is the spirit that we should come to church. That is the spirit that we should live every single day. Do you have the ability to believe that God, that when God makes a ridiculous statement, we believe it? 
Because sometimes it's ridiculous the things that the Bible says, that God says. Here, Jesus says, she's asleep. People, what the, the Bible says there, and they ridicule him. What are these ridiculous guys? What is it? Jesus, that's why Jesus, Jesus says, get out. For God, there is no ridiculous statement. Amen. For God can do anything. There is, God is not limited. Not even the grave can hold the power of his voice. God looks at the impossible and looks at it as possible. And that's something to consider, friends. Whatever struggle it is you're going through, whatever request you are asking, are you asking it and looking at it under your strength or under the strength that God has? There are many stories in Scripture. Take, for instance, Sarah getting pregnant at 90 years old. She laughed. Yeah, humanly, I would have laughed too. But if God says you're going to have a baby, God's word is telling you you're going to get pregnant. That, and that, that story is one of the stories that when I see Abraham in, in the kingdom, I always want to ask him and talk to him. Because there had to come a time where Abraham and Sarah had to trust the word of God. By this time next year, you will be with a child. Now, it wasn't a child like Jesus that the Holy Spirit came into Mary. No. Abraham and Sarah had to get to work. Knowing that what? God's word would be fulfilled. We need to have faith, but we need to do our faith, work our faith. We need to work our faith. So before God can do anything with us, we must remember two things. We need to give him the ruler in us. Just give it to him. We have to kill the tendency to try to control God and have it our way. That's why even in Jesus' prayers, he says, let not my will be done, but your will be done. Let your will be done. We need to stop making our problems bigger than someone else's problems. We're not the only ones with financial, if that's your problem. You're not the only one with cancer, if that's your sickness. I'm not trying to be mean or, or not have compassion. I do. But there are many people. And I praise the Lord that He can heal somebody here in Cleveland at the same time He can heal somebody else in another part of the, of the world. He can heal at the same time everyone who comes to him. That's why in Revelation chapter 14, for our closing text, Revelation chapter 14, verse 12, wrapping up the three angels' message, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience of the saints. The saints have patience because they trust in the will of God. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Friend, there is coming a time which is very soon that you have to have full faith and trust in Jesus. A hundred percent. Not even 99 will cut it. A hundred percent. Give it all to Him. Here is the patience of the saints. Some of us may come to church with this ruler problem and we want God to do it our way in our time. 
but just how a father knows better for their children, our Heavenly Father knows best for us, His children. Amen. And if there's any questions that you may have, ask Him when you get to the kingdom. Be faithful. And when you get to the kingdom, Lord, why didn't you answer this? And, he, and when He shows you, you're going to say thank you for letting it be done your way. For letting it be done your will. We need to come to Jesus with a touch of dependence on God and not like this ruler with a touch of self-dependence. How is your touch? How do you reach out to the Lord? The only way that our dependence on Him will grow or even have is, is spending time in His Word and in prayer every day. Not just today on Sabbath, but every single day. The scriptures are our safeguard. And it, the Bible tells us that faith comes by hearing the word of God. If you do not have a daily reading plan, friends, begin one. If you want to be saved. Begin one. So I just want to appeal to you this morning before we sing our closing hymn. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Not at my word. At his word. And I want to appeal to you. If you would like to lay your problem before the Lord today. And let him take care of it. I'm not saying that you're going to forget about it, but you are going to let Him worry about it. Let Him work it out. If you want to lay those problems before Him, I invite you to stand. I want to have a word of prayer before we sing. We need to... We need to put away our, our thoughts, our ideas, our opinions. I'm tired of hearing, well, I know that the Bible says this, but I think this. Friends, who cares what I think? What does the Bible say? Trust in God. You don't understand it as God to give you the heart to trust Him. The heart to follow Him. And the heart to obey Him. Amen. Father in Heaven, I come to You because You have asked us that when we need anything, we can ask You. And I am asking that you help me to trust more in you. To not be like this ruler who wants to control you and have it done my way. But to get out of the way and let you do it your way. I am nobody to rush you to do it your way. If it be your will, you can do it right now. If it be your will, and you want to wait, so let it be done. Father, many of us here come like Jairus with this heart of wanting to do it our own ways and thinking that we are the only ones with a problem. Well, I know that right now you are working miracles in other states in this country, in other places in this world. Help us to also be compassion for other people's problems. And to not look at our own as the only one. Be with us the rest of this day. Take our problems, Father, and answer them according to your divine and holy will. Even if we don't like it, Father, so let it be as you want. 
continue to guide this church, bless this church here in Cleburne and around the world. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.